day today. All right, so um, uh, we're going to look at, uh, we're on to, we took a big jump into chapter 10, which is nowhere near where this module is, uh, about broadcast writing. It's week six. Week six, thank you, there we go. So during week six, we're reading chapter 10. So now we're taking the book a little out of order. Uh, and um, if you have any questions to ask about your question writing assignment, Kyle just asked something, and I can repeat what we said there. And uh, I wanted to look into the uh, assignment, the radio feature script assignment, which is your next assignment. And the reason to look into this is because you're explicitly interviewing in order to do this assignment. So once again, in looking over uh, various things, I see most people understand pretty well the form of what a radio feature is, but we will go over that again uh, and maybe again. Um, you know, just trying to make sure everyone understands this. This is not an hour long fresh air interview. This is you're interviewing for sound bites uh, for uh, something which is rather like an extended rap. W-R-A-P, the rap style story we talked about, which is you talking plus little sound bites and then you talking some more and a sound bite and you talking some more. So that's what this type of thing is. Nick? What's the fresh air hour long sound bite? Uh, there's an NPR show, which is a, you know, kind of a famous interview show with host Terry Gross and it's called Fresh Air. Uh, what it is basically is an hour long interview show. Oh. And I'm sure there's plenty of others out there which, you know, Tons of podcasts, your Joe Rogan, your so on and so forth, Brian. Uh, so these are, are uh, you know, this is where you sit down with somebody and you talk to them for an hour. Right? Uh, okay. So you'll need a list of questions for that type of show too, of course. But uh, the result is very different than what we're working on now. And um, so the part of the challenge of the class is not just writing something, but writing in the format not just the way it's on the page, but also the way it has to sound and read, you know, having to do a number of different formats, basically. That's like, so in this case, radio feature. So we'll talk about what is the radio feature. Before we get into that, any questions about questions? About the question assignment, which is new. I used to just tell people, go and do your interview, and next week the radio features do, but we're taking an extra week. I will note that we've written all of about 400 words in the last five weeks. So I think you're kind of raring to go to, to write a few more words. <laughs> so go, as I was advising Kyle, uh, you know, he said, well, how many questions should we really have? And I suggested sit down and brainstorm out all the questions that you think you might want to ask and then look down the list and see if you're asking the same question in different ways which can actually be very profitable because sometimes you ask a question and they don't answer directly and then you need to ask it again and you don't want to repeat yourself because it appears rude. So then you will search for a different way of saying, of, of asking a question, you know, but uh, um, so that's one bit of advice about questions. Brainstorm, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to come up with some other extra questions that you don't actually ask. I won't grade you down because you have 15 questions instead of 10, you know, it's probably a good thing. Unless they repeat themselves constantly. Otherwise, I mean, uh, most, I think most people doing this would tell you that the questions are also uh, based on what it is, how you think the final product is going to be, like what kind of story do you want to tell? You know, uh, that, would, that would entail confirming some facts through other questions you ask, or it might, you know, if this is a profile, then, you know, what's your angle? If it's, you know, I don't know, somebody who's struggled in a particular way, your questions would go towards that. And I think you'd be thinking about, okay, what, what's life like for somebody who's, you know, for this person, and trying to ask questions that would evoke that, you know. If it's someone who's incredibly active, you know, in their chosen field, like, Maybe you could ask, like, where does all your energy come from? And, and other, other, you know, associated questions like that. Yeah. So, so a, a certain amount of it depends on what you want to come out of it, right? In terms of selecting questions. Open-ended questions, right? What do they, they lead to sound bites, closed-ended questions. They lead to yes or no, which can confirm 
facts, but then, then you're kind of supplying the information. So, yeah. so I hear you've been wrestling for six years. That's, yes, that's right. So, you know, how does it feel to be wrestling for the last six years? You ever get tired? Or then you're giving a more open question. So, yo, yo, yo. Will you be reviewing? Some people have already started for sure, but will you be reviewing our questions that we submitted, maybe providing some feedback? Or Probably just saying, okay, I got them okay. at this point. Yeah. Yeah. JP? How many um, sound like actualities do you want in your feature? Well, it's hard to say because some people use 30 second actualities and some people use like five second actualities. So, uh, I'd, you know, a half dozen might be a good starting point. Your, your feature is two minutes long. Mm -hmm. And, if, uh, you know, I'm comfortable with actuality that's about 15 seconds. So if you did six of those, that would get you up to 90 seconds already. So I don't think your six would be a full 15. So you know, maybe that's too many. So just think. I, I'd, I'd say, you know, maybe at least half of the story is told by you, the reporter. Of course. With, with you know, sound bites filling in and uh, providing context and a feeling for who this person is in ways that you couldn't do. So, is yeah half a good ratio or is there like a ratio that you should be kind of like three quarters to a quarter what what's standard or typical or you know I haven't really I haven't checked it out but what I'd say is the, the um, it's better to err on the side of you saying too much and them saying less you know because you, what this is, is you're writing the story you know there's no way that in their interview they can tell the story without your intervention and your crafting of it right Again, this is not sit down for an hour and ask a bunch of questions and it's a great conversation on the radio. This is you're telling us a story and you're using those sound bites just to, you know, give us a sense of who who's in this story and, and how are they experiencing it. Because so, so, so. that's that's what you can't really provide as well as a sound bite, I think. Okay, there are no questions about the questions or no more. All right, well, before we look at uh, the information that's out there about radio features, I have a whole bunch here that we could listen to. Uh, these are all from KCBS. As you can see, there's a couple down here from, uh, from NPR, which are awesome. So some of these are longer than what you're asked. To, you know, the assignment asks for two minutes. This one is two minutes, so let's give you a sense of uh, the length of time. Hopefully we'll hear it. It's a sport that's sweeping the nation, or at least the ice, and it's a sport that takes real stones. 42 pounds of granite. Okay, go hard, go hard. Sweep, sweep. Curling? Well, what we often say is shuffleboard's a game, bocce's a game, curling's a sport, because you have to be mentally alert, and then you have to be physically strong in order to do the sport. John Madden might take exception, but every four years, curling captures the imagination of the sporting world as... An Olympic event. Come across records of curling back to the 12th century in Scotland. So it's an age-old sport. Brent Helpenny, the president of the Bay Area Curling Club, says Scots came up with it when they couldn't play golf in the winter. It is a quirky sport. And not just because brooms are involved. It's actually in the rules that you be hospitable. If you're the winning team, you buy the losers a round of beverages of their choice. That's in the rules. That's in the rules. The Olympics? They buy each other drinks as well. Sweep! Sweep! Whoa. The idea is to push the stone as close to the target as you can. Then just push out. There you go. I went three feet. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm supposed to go 30 feet? Yes. I went three feet. Yes. That's good? That's good for the first throw. Sweeping? That helps melt the ice, and it takes the ability to walk down the ice, among other things. So you're going to sweep across the face of the stone. As you can tell, it's pretty hard to keep up with it. So we whoa, got the... whoa. <laughs> there you go. And, we, and you didn't go down. Are there many curling injuries? Not normally, no. no. You could be the first. Okay, let's get somebody in the hack. Let's throw a Apple was holding a team building event at the San Jose Ice Rink we were at, and they seem to be having fun. Got my cardio workout. It's good exercise. Uh, it's all about the brushing. The brushing is where you got to put a lot of effort in to make it slide farther. A lot more of a workout than I ever would have thought it was. Probably the most you can get with a broom. 
About the Bay, I'm Mike Sugarman, KCBS. All right, shout out to Shannon Cole, who is a, a, uh, a, curling, a curling fan. Okay, so uh, let's review what was in there, because it's really, like I said, it's just a long wrap, right? And, and what were your impressions about uh, the elements that are in there? So first, the reporter is, uh, is uh, let's call him Mike. It's Mike Sugarman, uh, left KCBS recently, so Mike. So uh, what did you notice about his part of this? Yeah? I kind sorry. of approached it um, from the uh, point of view of a novice. Yeah. He doesn't know much about the sport. and. It, as such, it, it, what I found interesting about it is that he used a lot of the sound, like the gnat sound, to kind of tell the story in and of itself. And then he used a few descriptives to get, give us an idea of what was happening. Because we don't know what curling is without looking at it. And then he describes the broom and the bristles of the brush. And, and he kind of injected humor into it, sort of de self-deprecating humor to, to make it a quirkier piece. Yeah, that's kind of his. Uh, have you seen other stuff by him? I but that's not. that's part I of his it, though, thing. Because I'm not a sports fan, but now I'm curious. I know what curling is because I, I remember when it was in the Olympics. And it helped. It seems like a goofy sport, huh? Like, this oh, makes fun. it like you be more curious about how people are really into it. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, cool. So yeah, great points. You know, he doesn't assume that his audience knows what he's talking about, and you know, I say visuality here, but you you know, you you said. Describes the broom and some of the stuff like that. Lots of gnat sound in there, uh, both the brooming, you know, sweeping of the ice, and also you can hear when they're actually playing the game. You get that big kind of echoey sound. You know, you're out there with gnat sound. And then Mike, um, he's not talking in great big long sentences, right? He's interjecting kind of and using the tape to to tell a lot of the story. So that might be a 50-50, Kyle. I'm not sure. You know, you know, often, often, they're, often they're driven more by the reporter than that. Okay. Yeah, kind of building off that, I would say he spoke about 60% of the time. But during the actual interview part, he spoke maybe 20% of the time. He always just used very short, open-ended questions and just let the guy get, run with it. Yes, got you. And some, some of these will not have, they won't use the questions at all. You know what I mean? They, they'll They'll just... Uh, they'll be like comments. Yeah, well, they'll, they'll take the actuality without playing themselves asking the question. Like he may have asked, uh, you know, wow, this is a weird sport. What's the history of it? Mm -hmm. And then they said, well, it's the Scots who decided to do this because they couldn't play golf in the winter. So then he would cut out that question and just play, it's the Scots who did this. Whatever oh. fits with the flow. Am I hearing, oh, is that, Jenny, oh. is that, are you saying, oh? Yeah. Oh, okay, because I was... I didn't think about that. I was thinking, you know, when you're asking the question, you would go ahead and put in you as the reporter asking mm. the question. But yeah, typically you don't. And some, some uh, stations will like, have a hard and fast rule about that. There's, there's another type of story that we don't practice writing called a Roser, R-O-S-R, -S reporter on scene report and that's just where the reporter is and we go now live to so and so so and so with the Hindenburg burning behind them and then you know they ask and so how did you feel when the whole thing exploded and so that would be you know reporter on scene report but um, we're not doing that so we don't need to write something like over to you Jim and then Jim says it's a sunny day out here in San Jose and I'm about to go into the skating rink where it's dark and clammy and they're playing some funny sport so, so it's, it's, uh, we don't need that. We, we, you know, as you heard, he goes right into the story and he's basically leading us. There's a lot of interjection. So I like the 60-40 as well. You know, maybe 60% uh, Mike and uh, I, I didn't even catch the name of the person he was interviewing. But, uh, so Let's go with Curler. Let's go with Doug. Doug, okay. <laughs> Doug the hoser. Yeah, there you go. So 60-40. Something like that, uh, but it was, and, and you saw that uh, he, you you don't need to kind of say something like, and then Doug the hoser told me that, and then you play the actuality, right? He's he's just you know he's kind of counterpointing or call and responsing off of off of the, the tape there, so I think that's a good example. Any any other things takeaways from this? Yeah, J, JP and then Jenny. Jenny's first. Okay, Jenny. No, I, I actually just had another clarifying question. So sure. My concern was if we do the 
ro roser where you you don't do the roser okay, sorry. not you not for credit that. yeah so my concern would be how would the audience know what the question was uh, if in this case in in that case yeah. using the nat sound using the actual right right well you you know the the idea is that mike is supposed to tell us a story in a way that we don't ask that question like if he's doing his job well we don't say well, why am I hearing now about these old Scottish people? You know, because what Mike is doing is he's kind of thinking, okay, I want to start out somewhere in the midst of the action. I don't want to back up 100 miles and then eventually get to the skating room. I want to start this, boom, in the action. So the first thing we hear is some gnat sound of, you know, and we're right in there with Mike as he's like saying, what is that? Or the equivalent of that, right? And then, then at a certain point, he's going to, back out there so he's going to start off in the rink with the dog or whatever eventually he's going to zoom out a little bit and he's okay so what's the history of this sport right and he doesn't have to even set that up we're just we're with him at that point it's like okay here's these people doing this thing when did this start you know we might be asking him to tell us that so if he does his job correctly he could start off at the very beginning you know and and, and sort of flood us with history like I do in BCST 100, and I'm continually frustrated by that whole thing. You know, but he starts off with incident, with character, with gnat sound, and then eventually he'll come out and he gets his, you know, in his, in his lineup of questions, he asked, okay, so how did this begin and stuff? And that's where he, he puts it later in there. Yeah, so right, remember we talked about story structure? So that's something that comes up again in the chapter that we talked about. Is it, Remember the, the, your typical print story would start out with you know, the news, which in this case, what is the news? It's kind of a profile of a sporting event and stuff. Uh, and, and it would go down to you know, the least important information. Whereas what, what Sugarman is doing here, the typical broadcast thing, is to start in the midst of action, something very specific, and eventually you kind of zoom out to the broader issue. And then probably by the end, you get back in there. Here, he kind of took a little. He went, he went to the Apple people who happened to be there at that time. In a longer wrap of a couple minutes or something, there's often a kind of a little, there's the opportunity to, to migrate the story a little bit into you know, something else. In this case, he got off a of Doug and he got onto the Apple team builders there. And, and you know, it was, it was okay. It was, you know, it, yeah. Micah, comment. So I did my interview on Sunday. And halfway through the librarian I was interviewing had to run away to do something and they directed me to another volunteer who I asked the rest of my questions to. Cool. Is it, if I can, can transition that well, is that still totally all right? Yeah, yeah, I think so, you know. So you can take, you can take some actuality from the librarian and then afterwards the volunteer, yeah. All right. Yeah, that's okay. I just wish I got some crowd noise from. Ah, but you can always lines. write it in, right? Since we're only writing a script here, you know, it may seem like gnat sound is just like a kind of like, oh, okay, I could... We can marry this. Right, right, yeah. Sounds good. So, uh, yeah, basically, for gnat sound, you think, well, what would be good? What, what would be, you know, useful gnat sound here? So, you know, in the script here, it would be gnat sound uh, uh, sweeping uh, and that kind of thing, you know. Right, we could hear another one. Uh, this is a longer, oh, let's hear a Holly Kwan. So it's different than Sugarman. Sugarman did something called uh, About the Bay, I think, was his weekly, both a video report that I think was on the news and uh, also a bunch of radio stories. So he specialized in kind of like local stories of local personalities. He was also really interested in marijuana. Um, he had. At some point, he had a serious illness in his neck or something, and he used medical marijuana for, for pain. Uh, and it led him to be really interested in dispensaries and the quality of what's sold there. Uh, so he did, he's done a number of pieces just on the total lack of standards. Did he do a lot of research? I think so. I, I think it came from, from immediacy, from personal experience, for sure. But, but, you know, he'd introduce the, in, the experts and stuff and find out the, the state of the art. But it was... It was shockingly, you know. That should all be updated here soon, huh? 
yeah, you know, I mean, they got to do something, right? And they've also got to do, like, law enforcement. I mean, if, is there a breathalyzer for being too stoned behind the wheel? I don't know. but It's coming. They it's can, coming? Yeah. It's coming. It's really, they have them, they've had them for a while. They're just really inaccurate because the thing with the THC and the CBDs versus, need, like, like, alcohol is it... Some people need, like, out of bed than other people. It's like, yeah, some people, it's just, like, it. everybody's body standards are very different oh, based on okay. it's fat soluble so basically I could be, what, do you, what do you heard brian about it well basically i could just be driving they pull me over and i haven't smoked yet and i could be going to jail really if how, they but smell how so it, it's probable cause if they smell it yeah, yeah. yeah. it's very but it's going to be legal soon right i mean it's already legal yeah okay but it's not legal to, it's not legal to use and drive wow. yeah so it's, it's, it's like, like even not to even a certain level. There's no there's no acceptable no. label. It's like it's not there's no equivalent to having a one glass of wine. They can't, they can't the figure end. out how much you smoked or ate ingested right. in the last hour. Right. So it's kinda of like out of area where it's like a gray area where they're trying to figure out how to make sure, okay, this person it's like if you take two shots, they know how much alcohol is in your system yeah. at that point. They don't have a way to fully say he smoked eight hours ago, or he smoked ten minutes ago. Right, right, and that's kind of like what you'd think they'd need. If yeah. yeah. Like if I eat an edible, I'm not gonna be able to drive anyway. Right, and they're not gonna smell it anyway either, right? Because you ate it, so it's like. But if I smoke a joint, I'm gonna drive for hours. Right. Yeah, and the, I guess the other thing is, you know, with the with the legal limit for alcohol, some people might be able to take double that and have no no impairment. But at least the law kind of said, okay, this is the limit. But I, it doesn't sound like they can reliably test you to find out. It's pretty serious. I mean, Colorado doesn't have a whole lot of issue, though. I mean, there's not a whole lot of people. <laughs> there's there's people, but I mean, I mean, Denver's huge. Driving yeah. under the Agreed. influence is still legal there, though. Is, is it? Weed. Yeah. Really? It's, no, you it's cannot, not a felony, or you, you can't drive and. No, that's not. That's not true. Yeah, you you can't you can't drive while high in Colorado either. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, we're, we're agreeing. They, um, traffic accidents are down. The, the tr most, like, the thing with pot versus alcohol is most people who get too high don't go to the, like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm driving anyway. It's like, you you're, drunk, you're, drunk, yeah. you're just like, oh, here we go. You're but isn't, isn't that because, I'm sorry, we're getting off on a sidetrack, but isn't that because alcohol is so much of a multi generational, accepted way of impairing yourself that we're, we're basically it's like okay grandpa's you know had a few too many again versus i mean weed is it not like a little more limited in the amount of you know consumption that goes on maybe but i mean I'm not sure. if i just like this is this is coming from personal experience but like if i'm really 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 drunk the, the like the frontal cortex is no longer making sound decisions. It's just yes. like monkey brain. So I'll go home, drive home now. Yeah, there's yeah. no thought process saying like you shouldn't drive. It's just like uh, get in the car, drive home. You're drunk. Like why not? When I'm for whatever reason, like if I've eaten a high dose of pot cookie and I'm just like freaking out, there's not like a there's a part of my brain that's just like still smart enough to be like you're too high, dude. You should probably just Smoke sit dance. here and, and <laughs> hang out. Let this pass out. Let this <laughs> go exactly. away. Pass out very soon. Okay, well let's get back on topic. But this is really interesting. Anyone wants to do a story about this, I'd, I'd be fascinated in knowing what's the state of the art in testing and you know people. Obviously, people are going to be the more they're doing it, the more this is going to be challenged and and. Uh, and people are gonna, you know, hit kids in cars and stuff as well. It's gonna happen. So, anyway, let's hear Holly Kwan, another KCBS reporter. And, uh, did I make this work? That Thursday evening, Chris O'Neill and her twin 22-year-old daughters were in their Glenview Drive home when they thought they felt an earthquake. And we thought it was the big one. Mary was in the family room, and Colleen and I were laying on the bed looking through the Nordstrom catalog. And then that happened, and I went, "Oh my God!" And then we like jumped up. As we were running out, the house was vibrating like there were trains running underneath it or something. And as I came out the front door, there was stuff falling from the sky, and I, you could hear it falling almost like rain. It was debris from the exploding gas line 100 yards away, which sent a searing flame overhead. We didn't have to look back. We just had to look up, and it was above us. I didn't think we were going to be able to outrun it. Mary, being a faster runner, got away, but Chris and daughter Colleen found their knees buckling as they stumbled to safety. I kept rubbing my hair the whole time we were running because my head was so hot I thought my hair must be on fire. 
and I thought we were going to just naturally combust from the heat. By the time all three had escaped, Chris found the twins suffering second and third degree burns to their arms. Just, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then Colleen was saying, I'm burned, I hurt. And then we remembered that our cats were in the house, and that I just... I that the whole time. I know. And I thought, I've got to get these girls out of here. And so I, I felt like I had to say something, like, shocking. So I said, they're dead. The house is gone. We gotta go. They got a ride to a friend's home where Chris called her husband, Gene, who was on his way home from Oakland and could see the column of smoke. You never think it's your house. You never think it's your neighborhood. It's your house. This time it was me. This time it was us, and we're just... Well, I think kids got out. Which is why they consider themselves lucky, but that doesn't stave off the anger. Colleen O'Neill. It's weird not having the privilege to go back to that house anymore. I can't even go and say this is my neighborhood. That's because you feel like your identity is gone, Chris O'Neill. You don't have your purse anymore, so when you go to get something, it's like we're, we are constantly losing things because we can't remember where we put them because we don't have a place. And even the routine is no longer that. I go do something that I normally do, like I exercise at Curves. I leave Curves and I go home. And I'm driving up San Bruno Avenue and I think, Go home? There is no home. Tomorrow we'll take a look at the unique neighborhood support network that embraced the O'Neills after the fire. In San Bruno, Holly Kwan, KCBS. Yeah. All right. It's dinner time at Kathy and John Fitzpatrick's modest San Bruno home. Every night since the fire, someone in the community has brought over dinner to feed not just the Fitzpatricks, but the newly homeless Jean and Chris O'Neill and their twin daughters, whose home was the last to burn on Glenview Drive. If I need meals for the next four weeks, I can get them. I can call up my friends and they will call other people. Kathy opened up her 1,200 square foot home to the O'Neills, running interference in the early days. Sometimes you don't have the energy to be able to answer the door. I can buffer who they talk to because it was difficult for them to even talk to people because it's emotional and sometimes you, by the end of the day at 5 o'clock you're exhausted. They're part of an eight family network that calls itself the Sunday Supper Club. For 20 years they've potlucked once a month, watched their kids grow up together, even camp together each year. It was that closeness that would never let the O'Neills take shelter in a hotel. I'm sitting here with a house. How could I not welcome them. It began the night of the fire when the O'Neill's 22-year-old twin daughters were being treated for second and third degree burns. The supper club came to the hospital for support. Chris O'Neill. And then we get to Kathy's house and there's the rest of the Sunday supper club. They've been getting food and clothes and we called it sisterhood of the traveling pants because whatever I put on everything fit me. <laughs> it's just it was amazing. San Bruno's mayor calls the town old-fashioned in the way everyone knows their neighbor. The day after the fire, Chris and her daughters had no shoes, having escaped with literally the clothes on their backs. Kathy took care of that. And I was able to run across the street to a neighbor and say, what size foot do you have? What size foot do you have? And she pulled out all of her shoes and it worked out well. So there's just this whole, you know, being there for each other. In an age when few of us know... Sorry. Know what? <laughs> You'll never know what we know in this age. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, I thought I was just going to minimize it. Yeah. So, do you mark it in the script like Nat Sound Train? Like, do you put yeah. in parentheses or something? Yeah. What's the formatting for that? Uh, like right. that. Nat so it's, sound. you don't have to put sweeping in parentheses or no. Quotes nope. Or just it would sweeping. be. Uh, let's just see here. Oh. Uh, and you also put in the amount of time, like five seconds or ten seconds. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, but uh, hang on a sec. Uh, get me back here. Where was it? There's this thing that I put up here. Radio news tutorial. Okay, that's it. So, boom, here we go. So the last of these, this, this was already... We referred to this when we were looking at the radio wrap. So here's a feature from NPR. And uh, as you can see, here's that sound the way it's written. OK, so they don't actually put it in brackets, but I would put it in brackets. See, so they, didn't, they didn't put the time of it down. True. So they got times and actualities. Yeah. So, okay, well, let's back up. I think, yeah, it's reasonable that the actualities would have time, but not the Nat sound cuts. Uh, because they're not as specific as uh, actuality. Like actuality, we know we're, we're 
covering something that somebody says, but here we fade in on the cash register sound and then we uh, probably fade it out below and cut it to the supermarket sound under the next three tracks. I mean, this is an actual NPR script, so well, the this is the they, way they do it. I feel like the reason they probably wouldn't time it is because it's not like eating up part of your two minutes. Yeah. A lot of times you're putting words and story over that sound as well. That makes sense. You're running it underneath. Yeah. So based on what we just saw, uh, don't put timings for your NAT sounds, but identify them as NAT, N-A-T-S-E-S-N-D. And what did I say just about? I'm just trying to see. I'm trying not to. Yeah, okay. So I say put it in brackets. Okay. That's how. Square brackets we're talking about. And when you are trying to uh, cater to the specific t time amount, like two minutes, three minutes, or whatnot, do I would think that they just go through their entire script and then they start editing to curtail to whatever time limit they have. Yeah, that's correct. They know, they know in advance that they're only going to get a certain amount of time. Uh, so I, you know, based on my experience, you write as economically as you can the, the whole way through. And if you happen to have any leftover time, you're, you can expand on something. If you don't, then you're, you know, you basically got, you've got the, sh you got to edit some more. Make more puns. Make more puns, right? I mean, you know, there's always, I, you, I can't remember having written something that was too short the first time I wrote it through. Uh, so each line of script, remember, it times out to from three to five seconds. So if you're shooting for 120, you know, divide that by five, and what do we get? 24. So about 24 lines, you know, if you're if if someone's reading slowly, and uh, you know, then depending on how fast you're intending on reading this, it could be more. Right, three to five seconds. So it would be. I'm sorry. Uh, each line will time out three to five seconds. Right. So. If it's three seconds, that would come out to about 40 seconds if someone's reading super fast for two minutes, which is not, you know, somewhere between 24 and 40. And, uh, but, you know, someone reading super fast for two minutes, it doesn't lead to great intelligibility. Maybe 24 to 30 lines? Uh, whatever. I say three to five, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't start telling people this is too long until they hit 40 lines. But realistically, you've got to read pretty fast. Yeah, so looking again at the script for the radio feature here, this, this is a piece uh, <clears throat> about people bouncing back in the economy, like basically they lost their good job and now they're doing a less than good job. So you see for the radio feature, it starts with the anchor introducing, just like the rap does. Uh, you can provide more context if you want because you've got more time. So this, this would be the anchor's intro, this part here. And then, so they haven't identified the reporter, but at this point it's the reporter talking. And uh, then as you can see, it's like a series of, a series of actualities and you know, NPR's doing a little bit more talking than uh, Mike Sugarman there, but they're telling a more complicated story. So in our feature, the anchor's intro is a little longer. If you wish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I'd say the main thing to think about in the feature is that you're the reporter, you're telling the story, whether it's of a profile or the event. Uh, so, so that's really what you want to focus on is, you know, giving, giving yourself an interesting way into the story. Again, if it's an event, maybe you could do the Mike Sugarman approach, which is, you know, start off somehow in the event, you know, um, with some that sound with an interaction that you witnessed while you were at the book fair or something like that. And then, you know, eventually come out to the broader context, you know, what the library gains from the book fair, how much money it could bring them, why they need the money, you know, does it supplement, you know, the funds they get from the city, uh, you know, 
how do, how do the people working there, the volunteers, what does it do for them to be involved in this? And they so get on. free books. They get free books? Is that the answer? Yeah. And how about satisfaction? Well, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll give them free books if they clean up my house. <laughs> get rid of them all, right? Uh, that's all a different right. story. Okay, <laughs> pass the message on. Like that. So, so this is the example anyway that uh, that you can draw on. Uh, let's hear uh, let's hear something completely different. The Kitchen Sisters. Um, the Kitchen Sisters are uh, an award-winning uh, radio producer pair uh, who've been working in the Bay Area for 15 years, and uh, they've had numerous. Um, series that the, they put on public radio. They also have the occasional um, uh, kind of three-day seminar that uh, one of our students took last semester, and she really, really loved it. She took it over the summer, and, uh, and it was pretty awesome, apparently. And they teach at the Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism as well how to do audio, audio documentary. Um, so this is beyond the scope of our assignment, but it's fun. Nick? Why are they called the Kitchen Sisters? Uh, I guess that's what their, that's the their, their, their entertainment, entertainer names, I guess. They're not real sisters, no. Uh -huh. They're too, uh, do you want to see who they are for a sec? Yeah, I think I'll get it. Here they are. They are, they look like sisters. <laughs> We are definitely <laughs> story collectors. I think collecting's in our blood. You know, it's it's exciting. It's uh, it's like these little discoveries. It's um, it's like prospectors who are mining for <laughs> gold. You know, having something that is just shimmering and is so hot and dynamic and compelling, you just have to follow it. Your mind starts immediately hearing all the things that might go with it. The music, the ambiences, the field recordings, the photographs, the other people you might talk to. We say our microphone is a divining rod. You know, it's a Geiger counter, it's a stethoscope, listening to the complicated heart of the nation. stories from the B side of history, the sort of the lost, the hidden, the little known, the voices that just don't usually make it to the air. We don't voice our pieces. You don't hear our voices, or very little, um, in most of our stories. When we started out, we were working on this one story about um, Ernie Morgan, the world's champion one-handed pool player. We got there and it was just fabulous. You know, the jukebox, the smoky bar room, the guy, he had this great voice, wonderful storyteller. We, we began to put it together. Our voices were in it. And when we listened to it in the studio, it just completely took you out of the place. It became a different story. And I think we began eliminating ourselves. Pretty soon we were out of it. And it, it was very cinematic and very much like you are here and this person is talking to you in your ear. I just got in my blood just like a man on dope or drinking whiskey, you know. It gets in the blood, he's got to have it. I love it. I'd die if I didn't get to play sometime every day a little bit. The football shot, I'll show you that in a minute. The kind of slight perversity of what we do strikes me often. Like sometimes I watch us and we're just bending over backwards, pretzeling ourselves to ask someone to describe everything and make it visual. You know, describe the furniture. Oh, what did it look like in the room that day? Why aren't we just working in visuals? 
trying to get it into that visual dimension, but we want to use that medium of sound. Because, at least with good radio, something about it seeps into you. You are creating it along while you hear it. Your imagination is individualizing what you're hearing. You know, that's the beauty of it all for all of us. I think that's, well, that's storytelling. It's not a literal word, I think, radio. It's definitely a little device that sound comes out of, or it's an art form, but it's a state of mind. Radio is a state of mind. What do you mean by that? <laughs> can I just leave it there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. <laughs> so now, of course, you want to hear what they do. So this is from a series they made about the making of Radiotopia from PRX. Welcome to Fugitive Waves. Lost recordings, shards of sound, along with new tales from around the world and down the street. Stories from the flip side of history. We're the Kitchen Sisters. I'm Nikki Silva. I'm Davia Nelson. We have a saying in the Kitchen Sisters shop. Say everything out loud. Whatever you're looking for, tell everyone, and that's how you'll find it. The making of the Bay Bridge. The making of a jar of jam. The making of the iPhone. An opera. A surfboard. The Kitchen Sisters and KQED are launching a new series, The Making of. What people make in the Bay Area and why. What are you making? How about your grandmother? your neighbor, the guy you sit next to at work. Call our listener phone line and tell us your story. 415-553-3362. That's 415-553-3362. The Making of, coming soon to KQED. We opened up a phone line on KQED FM in San Francisco and posed the question. You have 87 new messages. The calls came pouring <laughs> in. I make the future. I'm helping to write a law to switch San Francisco to a 100% solar-powered society within the next 10 years. We make hand-built chicken coops and pedal in California. We really don't know what each other makes. Our income, it's like this uh, invisible elephant in the room. We never talk about what we make, and yet we're all living in sort of a different world. I built probably about 30,000 surfboards. We were in the midst of this hunt when we got a tip from Armistead Maupin. Armistead wrote Tales of the City, a column, the books, the TV series. He helped on the musical. Tales of the City, one of the first and most iconic stories of a young gay man coming out in San Francisco. Armistead was the one who told us about Lenny Breedlove and the homobile. In fact, it was Armistead who sent Lenny Breedlove to us one day when we were late for the airport, had to make a flight, and were starting to panic. Panic ye not, said Armistead. The homobile is on the way. Lenny pulled the homobile up to the curb outside our office with seconds to spare. We were up tight, and so was Lenny. Let's just say it was not love at first sight. Can we go all the way down to the park? You don't want to go on Harrison? I like that ball park way in, yeah, just because yeah. it's pretty and beautiful. Okay. Can I drive to no, the I'm just going to say it. Can we get, make it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. The Making of the Homobile, a story of transportation, civil rights, and glitter. He took the bomb. <laughs> This is the beginning of the doc. Hey, homobiles, Lenny. 859 Union. Yeah, hey, could you text me that? One babe, one bag. Going to ask Bo. I will give it to the driver, and they'll be there in about 10 minutes. I was having a hair appointment. I was getting my hair blown out at Dina's Glamorama. My friend said, Lenny Breedlove has started homobile. Call if you need a ride. And so I told them where I was, and I needed a car. They sent, I think it was Musty Chiffon. Yes, it was Musty Chiffon. She showed up and was my driver. So all of a sudden, this person who I'd known in clubs, we were driving in a car and talking with each other. They asked for a suggested donation. And of course, you just want to give them the entire contents of your pocketbook because they're so lovely. See what I tell you. 
traffic. My name is Lenny Breedlove. I run Homemobiles, a community ride service for the LGBTIQ, LMOPQRST community, and its allies in San Francisco. You do not have to be a big fat queer to get a ride from Homemobiles, but it does help. No. <laughs> you need to understand that the real reason that we are here is for people that don't get rides normally from anyone else. And so if you're putting on all this padding, high heels, a wig, and three sets of false eyelashes, and a bunch of glitter. You are high priority at Homobiles. First I was afraid, I was petrified. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But then I spent so many nights... My name is Godiva Chocolatier. We're at the stud in San Francisco, and right now you're seeing me in my night drag. I'm wearing gold lame pants and a platinum wig and lots of fabulous makeup at nighttime when I go out and, and this is how I look, you know, fabulous and avant-garde, not a cab will take me. Are you Grant? Yes, sir. How are you? Where are you headed to? Wisconsin Twinkle. My name is Becca Scherzer. We're driving in my Toyota Tacoma truck, which also doubles as a homobile because of drag queens, sex workers, trans folks, queers, not being picked up, given a hard time, harassed. It was really important for us to get our folks around safely. I had a band called Trebate, and I had a bike messenger company called Lickety Split, all-girl courier in the 90s. And then I had a dog walking company, Uncle Lenny's School for Dogs. I drove all over town picking up dogs. And then it was a moving van called Van Dyke Hauling. <laughs> One day I was driving a friend of mine around who's a lady of the night and a trans person. I was dropping her off at some hotel and I was like, don't you want me to wait? Don't you want to text me in case something weird happens? Don't you want me to be the tough guy? So then me and a friend of mine were brainstorming about what I could do. And he's like, well, you got your car, right? Why don't you be that tough guy for the exotic dancers and the what have you? And then you could call it Ho, Mobile. Get it? Then one day, I was invited to the Dem Conference in Oakland. And I showed up, and they were like, oh, a bush with a car. And so I was like, oh, I'll be right back. So I ran down the nearest do it yourself car wash and came back and I was blasting La Tigra. I was like, I'm so excited. I just can't I'm so excited. Was blasting out of the car. Babes were standing on the corner, and they all piled in. There was about six hotties. Or squeezed into the tiny Mitsubishi. And then I went back and got more and brought them back. And I was like, hey, babes, free rides. By then, drag queens were like, hey, we're fams. We have high heels. We have big hair. We need rides. And then all the fags were like, ah, yeah. And so did we. And so did everybody suddenly was a homobiler. And that's how it happened. We have over 20 people that drive their cars. It's all by donation. All the drivers are volunteers. I want to drive. I have a car. I have four doors. <laughs> because I have a truck, I get a lot of performers carrying equipment, drag queens and all their bags and their boys. And a lot of cabs and stuff won't take people with, you know, they don't like glitter in their cabs. They don't like all kinds of bicycles and whatever. Now, I'm not a big glitter person, but, you know, I wear sequins, so I'm sure I leave sequins in many places. My name's Justin Vivian Bond. I'm a transgenre artist. People get freaked out by glitter, and I don't blame the drivers, because if you get a lot of glitter or makeup or body paint in your car, it's hard to get out. I guess that's one of the drawbacks of the carriage trade. Women who are like exotic dancers and stuff use this a lot because they don't like cab drivers knowing where they live. They've been propositioned all night for their job. Now they're getting propositioned all the way home. They want silence or at least sweetness, not skeeviness. I think it is a safety issue, but it's also kind of a civil rights issue because when someone perceives you as presenting a gender that they don't want to uh, accept, then they feel like they have the right to ask you any inappropriate question, and you always have to be on high alert. It's 157, which is the magic hour, and right now the dispatcher is pulling his hair out because he's trying to get 500 queers home with seven homobiles. That means there's lots of homo shuttling going on right now. 
My mom is about to get a ride from Home Beals to the airport tomorrow. Because you can trust Home Beals. With your mom. With my mom. Bye, mom. Home Beals International. Home Beals Bombay. Home Beals Bloomington. Home Beals Berlin. Wait a sec. Mo's getting hoes where they needs to go. Balin, what's up, dude? Dude, dude, I got the best tag for you. Uh, I told you you could be there in 10 minutes. Did I lie? I'm so Okay, that's the end of that documentary. Is this before Uber or like, how old is this? Oh, it must be like six or seven it's years old. At least three, three years. Course. Three years it's since they posted it there. It's like literally the equipment thing, but just like, if you dress like a drag queen and Uber can't like, I mean, I guess they could, but like, they probably wouldn't care. It's their a, car. It's an Uber wouldn't care. Their own think? car. I don't know. What's their own car? I don't know. I mean, Uber. Yeah. Uber, Uber this seems like that would be way more useful before Uber and Lyft and stuff. Mm, I see. Okay. Yeah, we gotta but, pick up everybody. Yes. Yeah, I gotta pick up everybody. No choice. No. Even if they might leave something in your car. What? Even, well, if they're covered in body paint, for instance, in the late at night or something, they come sit in your seats. I can. Can't cancel. Yeah. If I look at them and they're like. I want to cancel it, but it, yeah. overall, I just take people and it helped me driving gays and transsexuals around. It helped me understand them. Like, oh, you guys are cool. Oh, I'm not gay. Oh, you're not gay? Cool. All right. Everybody's cool now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Before I was like worried and I was like, they started touching me. I'm like, don't touch me, bro. I'm not like that. And now it's all cool. We're all cool. Like, who cares? Gotcha. So homobiles wouldn't, I mean, they'd already just, that wouldn't even be an issue. But um, one of the things that I like about this, and we could talk about you know, their different approach, but one thing I like about it, in addition to the sound quality, which you can barely hear here because it's not quite loud enough, but uh, it's, it's the way that they build into the story a justification of why it's an important story. I mean, you could still just do this, and it would be fun. You'd hear people and stuff. But they, you know, they touch explicitly on you know, the kinds of difficulties that uh, you know, this clientele would have, maybe it has changed in this day and age, maybe not, but what I appreciate in it is they, they explain to you why this is important. You know, I think that's a good, that's a good heads up for even the type of radio feature that we're doing. Is like, don't think maybe, don't, don't assume that your subject justifies itself. You know, in this case, again, you could have done this all, oh, it's fun, they drive people around, but instead they explicitly dwell on yeah, you know, these, these particular workers get harassed all the time. They need a safe ride home. You know, whether it's a taxi driver or an Uber driver or whatever, you don't know who you're getting in with. And they, you don't know what kinds of, you know, how, 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 how much they feel they're justified in, uh, you know, questioning or whatever. So in this case, it's kind of like a safe space on wheels. And so, Cool. So it kind of justified as to why we should care about this ride-sharing service, which is really just another ride-sharing service. I thought that was cool. Jenny? A question and an observation. So noting that it is 21 minutes and you did stop it, it a reminder this is a feature, right? Because this, this is a podcast reworking of a thing that was about 8 or 10 minutes long. So they've repackaged. So as it aired on NPR, it wasn't 21 minutes long. It was like 8 minutes long. Then they took all of their library and they've been putting them all out as a podcast. So if you search Kitchen Sisters in podcasts, you can get dozens and dozens of 21 minute podcast episodes, which is basically reworking the old material. So is this like a collection of their eight minute broadcasts? I guess. On the home opening? I guess. Yeah. Okay. I guess. And then the observation is, I guess, from this short period of time, I can see how the diamond structure is worked in. Because initially, I'm thinking, well, what are you getting at? What are you getting at? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then they're going into the immediacy of the person, the character, yeah. and then it's building up to, well, we get harassed. We get prejudged. And then, and then, and then. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's very interesting. What you're saying is that you're, you're not leading with the hard information. And Jenny's saying, OK, where's the hard information? But you are building the character, the sound, and, and yeah. 
And so what did those voices say to you? I, I mean, are, were they interesting voices? Were there characters behind them? What was your response to the people that we heard? I thought they were colorful and they kind of presented a vibrance that's difficult to achieve through audio alone, mm -hmm. but they were able to sort of convey that in um, their descriptions and um, just some of the things that they had to say. So you were able, even though you couldn't see them, the one person described his gold lame pants, which I thought was fantastic. Nice description, yeah. right? Yeah. So I could envision that. that le others were less descriptive about what they're wearing, but you get an idea. You know? Right. It's like, OK, right. if this person's a dry queen, you can almost imagine the wig and the, la the magnificent lashes. That's right. a good one, too. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. You get, get this sort of um, flavor uh, as to what their lifestyle is, and gotcha. of course, and how it makes you understand how it could be difficult to stand on a street corner and try to hail a cab. And, you know, in, in, in the age before Uber and Lyft, it was scary. I used to perform, not drag, but I used to perform in New York City when I lived there. And the meatpacking district back then was just completely filthy, gross, and nasty. So hailing a cab there, exiting a club, was like a, a, a free-for-all. And, and then cab drivers back then, or even now, they feel like they can ask you anything about what you're doing. Why are you dressed like that? You know, and this is like um, the full heyday of like the gothic club scene in, in New York. So you come out and you just look like a complete, like, I, I don't know, and they don't know what to make of it. But they want to ask you everything. They want to touch your arm and touch your tattoos. Okay. Why do you have this pierced or whatever? So okay. right. it's a shame. But the whole time I thought it's a shame that they didn't have something like this in New York City when I gotcha. lived there because this yeah. would have been very convenient, especially to a lot of Everybody would have used it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Well, lots of cool stuff in there that you're relating, yeah. relating to that aspect of it. And, and uh, yeah, even just the names of the performers. The I think, names of I think it was Brandy right. Chiffon or whoever it was like, I can't remember. It was somebody yeah, Chiffon get, who picked me up. Godiva Chocolatier. <laughs> yeah, Godiva Chocolatier. Yeah. Yeah. So all, all of that's giving, giving this, this approach a whole. Did she say cinematic in the little video that we watched as they're coming? Because, because it, the, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that we're doing this. In fact, we're absolutely not doing this. We're doing Mike Sugarman driving the whole story with his voice. But in the state of the art, there's another way to do this, which is the way that they're kind of doing it, which is it takes enormous amounts of of recording time and skill, and you know, you also have to have. Uh, the kinds of, of copyright agreements that public radio has so you can put in any song you want that you don't have to pay for you know these really well-known pieces of music or stuff so, so that's another issue that gives that gives them the freedom they can to pick whatever they like so uh, yeah so don't want to confuse you and i probably have but i also just wanted to play some really great stuff so <laughs> that's all got sovereign pardon me got sovereign yeah Gotcha. <laughs> you have it uh -huh. somewhere in your modules. You have a Doug Sovereign piece. Do you want to hear some, Doug? I, I would like to. Okay. I, I, well, can we maybe come to that next class? Sure. Or? sure. Because I just wanted to take a look, uh, and we'll come back to this next class, too. Here. But um, <coughs> just, you know, we're always looking at uh, the textbook, so what's the text? So, Chapter 10 is all about writing for broadcast versus the rest of the textbook has been, you know, giving us general information about writing and reporting for all media so far. But this, this chapter is specifically about broadcast. It combines both radio and television. So we're only taking the half about radio right now, but then we'll come back and read the other half about television when it's time to talk TV, which will be after the radio feature, right? So, um, you know, things that they've said already, they've said be concise, but in broadcast writing, be even more concise. Um, they're saying also, you know, those simple sentence structures that uh, we talked about with, uh, you know, noun, verb, noun, verb, object, um, those are, you know, in broadcast writing, it really is that simple sometimes. So I know I probably commented on some of your readers and raps you know, just, just pointing out that something could be said more simply or that, uh, uh, you know, the kinds, of, the kinds of structures that work okay in print, you know, where you're paralleling certain things or you're writing, you're writing in a way to, to, you know, create almost literary oppositions, they don't work so well when you're writing for the ear, 
you know, and what works well for the ear are, is, you know, short, casual sentences, you know, and I guess Mike Sugarman would be, you know, an example. Some of those were sentence fragments, but really what he's doing is moving along the story with, with his voice there. So concise, uh, find concrete nouns and vigorous verbs. I mean, I think even what we were talking about, you know, in, in the Kitchen Sisters saying, get people to describe stuff, you know, uh, is I, those that will produce concrete nouns. You know, remember what the textbook meant about concrete nouns was, you know, nouns that inspire kind of visualization in the minds of your of your readers or people who are listening to you. You know, so um, that's that's something to be paid attention to. Right to be heard. Use common words that are used in their most familiar ways. Uh, so I guess. That's another thing in terms of word choice. Uh, often in our first drafts, myself included, you may use a word because that's the one that comes to mind. Even the word concrete, I seem to remember myself using it five different ways, you know, within the space of like five lines, um, you know, because you know none of this is poured in concrete, but you really want to have concrete nouns to give people concrete visualizations in their minds. And so, Maybe some of those words could be, you know, simplified. <laughs> so that's something to think about word choice, using things in a way that everyone will grasp as quickly as you can. Short sentences, one idea each. And so again, I'm, I'm the most guilty party here about writing very long sentences with two or three clauses in them. Uh, and uh, I could go back into those sentences and usually break them up into, you know, smaller complete sentences and think about you know how many ideas are you sandwiching into each sentence or for that matter each question is you'll hear it's very hard for people to answer a question which actually contains two questions at once so whether you're looking into your questions or into the writing you're doing afterwards try to you know one sentence one idea and we used to even have on the radio like one mic break, one idea, to try to stop ourselves from going through to saying like 10 things, and it, it all of a sudden turns into this huge you know, bit that no one wants to listen to. Um, so one idea per intervention might be a good idea. Uh, choose words that have a sound component to them as opposed to words that don't. Hmm, interesting. How can we translate that into an example? use words that you can provide pronunciation to? Uh, I think beyond that, I think it, 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 it's driving towards using the word driving. For instance, if you're you know, just trying to say going towards something, but you know, driving towards your point or something like that uh, is going to give you, is that a sound component? Driving, I'm not sure. It's like zooming or? Yeah, I, these are, that's a good example, JP, in the sense that they're, they're, they're at least evoking an imagery. Maybe it's kind of an audio imagery. You should look through, it. there's probably some examples in the textbook that are on there. Writing to be spoken, make the writing as universal and the text as clean as possible for the reader, okay? So that means rereading what you write, simplifying, reading it out loud. Is there, a, is there a simpler way to say this? Does it really flow when someone's reading it? That would be helpful. Um, interchanging words like children for kids. Yeah, OK. So um, a couple of readers and raps uh, were repetitive in this way. and, and so we touched on this in a couple of ways. First of all, if you are, you know, um, if your story is about CCSF, obviously the first time that you mention it, you're going to want to say City College of San Francisco so that people know what you're talking about. And then continuing on in your story, rather than keep saying City College of San Francisco, you might want to, you know, say the college or City College. Or, so this is the idea that don't repeat yourself, but find ways of saying the same thing so that it's not repetitive. Again, if you feel that your audience would understand what CCSF is, it's okay to go there. But often you'll just want to be, you know, finding an alternative way of saying something so that you don't repeat yourself. So it helps just if people hear a lot of repetition in the story, they kind of zone out based on the repetition. 
Uh, use short sentences and a conversational structure so that breathing becomes a natural part of the delivery. So there again, if you write a very long sentence, you'll feel yourself gasping for air when you're reading it back. Um, so you want to break those sentences up so that it's easier to say them. That's it. Write in a way that first attracts attention and then delivers information. Oh, that's interesting. So definitely in terms of your lead, you know, uh, again, you may not have the most informational part of your story right up front. That's okay. Get people's attention first, especially with the lead, and then, you know, you can fill in more information later on if you want. So again, if you're doing an event especially, it's like, you, maybe you, you want to jump into the midst of the event with the start of your of your uh, of your piece, your feature, and then maybe later on get out to the, the the information that may not be that interesting. The first thing up in the story, you know, if if you can hook people's attention with an interesting character or an image or some kinds of interaction which you can you know, immediately bring into the start of your story, then later on the information can follow. Cool. And we'll deal with script basics next class. Uh, but any, any thoughts on what we're reading? Is basically a lot of this we've been saying since the beginning. Right? OK, good. So we played a lot of examples of the radio features. And I'll play another, you know, some stuff by by popular demand, we'll play some more next class. Just again, reminder, you're interviewing in order to do something like this. You're not interviewing to kind of do a long, in-depth interview where you let the person do the talking. You're, you're the one who's going to direct your story this way. OK, good. See you next on Thursday. And we'll listen to more of this and read more PowerPoints and try out the web quiz. Thank you.